Good morning and welcome to What is True. I'm Don Patton. Together with Dennis Caro, we talk to you about truth, the truth of God's Word on Sunday mornings. We'd be glad to have you worship with us at the Little Rock Church of Christ at 9.30 and 10.30 Sunday mornings at uh, in the Breckenridge Ridge Shopping Center. I'd like to talk to you this morning about the church. This expression, the church, that we have here in quotes is found 61 times in the New Testament. It uh, would seem to be then a very important concept, and yet there are a lot of people today who are leaving the church and not a part of it anymore. We notice, for example, Statistica's chart, which indicates now then it's below 50% just since 2000. Uh, 68% down to 46% in 22. Uh, the black line indicates the nose now above 50%. Why is that happening? Well, I don't think it's because people have lost faith in Christ, for example. This survey indicates that most of our young people and uh, elders as well believe that Jesus was a real person uh, and the vast majority indicates they would like to grow spiritually. There's no lack of spiritual interest, but when it comes to the church, uh, we see interest going downhill. I think one of the main reasons is that what people think of when they look at the church has little to do with what's in the New Testament. And that's absolutely true, and I'm turned off by that. Uh, mainline denominations are not found in the Bible. Those that claim they're the original church are an elaborate hierarchy that's not found in the Bible. There's nothing like that in Scripture. And so people are turned off. They like to see what they find in the Word of God. What, what does the New Testament church look like? It's not what we're seeing most of the time in the world around us. We're looking here at a picture of Caesarea Philippi. Uh, this is where Peter confessed Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God, when Jesus asked him, who do men say that I am? And this backdrop, I think, is an important part of the conversation. This is the backdrop there at Caesarea Philippi where the confession was made, this huge outcrop uh, formed the basis of what he's talking about. Some people say, well, the, he, he's saying that the church is built on Peter when he goes on to say in verse 18, if on this rock I'll build my church. No, it's the bedrock of truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that is the foundation of the church. There is a play on words with Peter's name and then this huge outcrop background here. Uh, the word Pet uh, Petros uh, is Peter. That means stone or pebble. But then similar to it, but different, is Petra, which is, according to Bedag, the brown driver Art and Gingrich uh, authoritative Greek lexicon, distinguished from stones. This rock, upon this rock, this bedrock of truth, I'll build my church, the bedrock being the divinity of Jesus Christ. That's what he'll build the church on, and that's what we should be seeing. That's what we're talking about in the New Testament, those who become Christians built on the bedrock of Jesus Christ. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we read, No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the foundation of the church. But when we look at the church today, it's going in all directions, and the New Testament church certainly was not divided. In John 17, we read, I do not pray for these alone, Jesus in the garden before his crucifixion, but for those who will believe on me through their word, that is the church, 
those who build on this foundation. I, I pray for them, the apostles, and for those who believe on him through, uh, through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That prayer is not answered today. Uh, it's, <laughs> we see rebellion. Uh, and the reason then that people reject is they see this, this is not what Jesus prayed for. And when people are teaching different things, that's not truth. Jesus prayed that they all be one that the world may believe. Well, the world is not believing because they're not one. They're divided. That's one of the primary reasons. Notice the Apostle Paul's plea in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that there be no divisions among you. And I hear people saying, I'm thankful that there are so many different ones. You can just choose whatever you want. Uh, that's not going to produce faith. Uh, people teaching different things are not teaching truth but you be, you're to be perfectly joined together, the same mind, the same... When we just do what the book says, instead of adding the products of human history and tradition, uh, we can be united. Uh, notice what we find in Ephesians chapter 1 when he's describing the church as the body of Christ, a figure that describes unity. Uh, in Ephesians 4, there's one body and one spirit like there's one head or one hope. Uh, that's not the, you don't have a head with a hundred bodies. That's not the picture in the New Testament. Uh, now this is not to be exclusive. It's not meant to exclude anybody. It's inclusive. It includes everybody who acknowledges and submits to Christ. That's the body of Christ. The meaning of the term church might be helpful. This is the Greek word, which of course we find in the original. Uh, and that's defined this way uh, by Bedag, called out or forth, uh, a gathering of citizens, uh, an assembly of people, any gathering or throng of assembly, an assembly of Christians. Now, there's a group from which, uh, of many from which we have some called out. It's used in a secular sense in the New Testament several times, might help us get uh, a concept. Uh, Acts 19, uh, if you want to know anything beyond this, it'll be settled in the lawful assembly, referring to the, the legislature of the time. In Acts 19, there was a, a mob referred to. So then some were shouting one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. Now that's the word, ecclesia. Uh, the majority didn't know for what reason they'd come together. But then the ones that are called out by Christ uh, out of the world are the ones that he is referring to when he talks about his church. Romans 3 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and called forth out of that group is his church. In Romans 7, he says, making me a prisoner of the Lord, which is in my members. Uh, that's the case with the world, with everyone. And we're not going to hell because we did this or we did. We're separated from God by sin. Everybody is, and God is holy and cannot tolerate that. And he redeems those out of that condition. Paul in Romans 7 said, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? The situation of everyone is described in Ephesians 2. And he says, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, uh, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God. Now that's the condition of those who are prisoners, those who have sinned, separated from God. And that is what Jesus came to remedy. He says, on, my, on this rock, the divinity of Christ, I'll build my church, the, the group that's called out of the world, 
the prisoners, strangers, alienated from God are called out. And that group that's called out is the church built on the divinity of Christ. Uh, Acts 20 tells us that they were to take heed to themselves to all the flock to shepherd the church which he purchased with his own blood. That's what the church is. Those who were purchased with the blood, called out of the world, they become his church. He has the right to do that as the divine Son of God proved to be that by the resurrection. He is, uh, we read in Acts 2 that those who responded uh, had favor with all the people of the Lord and the Lord added to the church daily those who were saved. That's what the church is. Uh, not saved because they're in the church, they're in the church because they're saved. That's what the church is. It's the saved, those who are called out, purchased by the blood of Christ. In Ephesians 5, he says, church, uh, Jesus, uh, Christ is the head of the church, the savior of the body. Now, you wanna know what the New Testament church is? That's it. It's those who have been saved. It's not excluding anybody because of skin color or because maybe they're eunuchs as described in Acts chapter 8. They are all included when they obey God, when they believe Jesus Christ and submit to His will. No one is excluded. All are included and should be united. He gave Himself for the church, we're told in Ephesians chapter 5. Well, I'm not that concerned about the church. Well, Jesus was. He died for the church. He purchased the church with his blood. He gave himself for her. That's the body of the saved. How can we say we're not interested in that? When we see the concept of the church that is in the New Testament, admittedly different from what we see in the world, then we see that which should pique our interest. It certainly did God and Jesus Christ. The church is the called out and it is that which is called out by Christ. I think this will help us define what we see in the New Testament. In Acts 19, there were some that were called out, but they weren't called out by Christ. Demetrius, a silversmith, made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called together the workers of similar occupation. And some of them cried one thing, some another. The assembly, that group that was called out, was confused. We have those who consider themselves Christians who are called out into a group, but not by Christ which was the case at Corinth. And Paul is condemning that when he says, I plead with you that there are no divisions among you. What I mean is each one of you says, I follow Paul or I follow Apollos, or, I follow Cephas, or, I follow Christ, perhaps in that divided denominational sense. Uh, we should follow Christ, but we should be united and we shouldn't have people wearing different names, divided, defining the differences, which is what denominationalism is. He says, I will build not my churches, but my church in Matthew 16. Again, not exclusive, but inclusive of everyone who has submitted to Christ and become a Christian. He said, shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his blood. Now, those who have been purchased ought to follow Christ, called out by Christ, and do his will. When they do that, then they're going to be together. And the division that is defined in denominationalism is not that. It's contrary to the prayer of Jesus, to the pleading of Paul, and to the concept of what the church is all of those called out by Christ, purchased by the blood of Christ, submitting to His will. Well, that raises another question. How is the church called? And there are lots of different ideas and I think misconceptions about that and that produces some of the division. 
Some point to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. He was called, but that's not the reason that he was called. Three days after this, he was still told what to do to wash away his sins. I have appeared to you for this purpose, he uh, has explained to him in Acts chapter 26, verse 16, to make you a minister and a witness of the things which you've seen. The apostles were witnesses in that primary sense, not going out telling people in the, the, the sense of just telling, but the sense of, I saw it. I saw Jesus. I saw him raised from the dead. Uh, and we do have to be drawn, but we're not witnesses like the apostles were. In John 6, no one can come to me except the Father who sent me draws him. Okay, but how do you do that? Well, we look at the next verse. It is written in the prophets. They shall all be taught by God. This is how they're drawn. You can't come unless you're drawn. How are you drawn? You're taught by God. Everyone who has heard and has learned from the Father comes to me. That's how Jesus is saying we are drawn. That's why in John 8, he says, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Knowing the truth has nothing to do with the, uh, the zapping, the direct operation, the uh, experience concept of salvation. And nobody in the New Testament was saved that way. They were taught and they were drawn by the truth. They're called by the gospel as it's expressed in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He calls you by our gospel. And that's why we read in Romans 1 that the gospel, not the experience that made Paul a witness, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. The truth, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ uh, that is the foundation of our faith in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, I declare unto you the gospel. What is that? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The, the basic meaning is, uh, is good news. Christ died, he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, we have to believe the gospel, but that's not the end of it, we also have to obey the gospel. And that's a concept that <laughs> causes some to furrow their brow and say, what are you talking about? The problem with some, they heard, but verse 16 of Romans 10 says, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Well, how do you obey the gospel? Fundamentally, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's very important that we know that, Second. Thessalonians 1 that speaks of the flaming fire and vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel. Uh, I think we better know how to believe it and we know how to obey it, but how do you do that? I think when we look to Romans, it becomes very obvious how that's related to the gospel and how we obey the gospel. Romans 6 says, Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ, have been baptized into his death? That's how we get into the death of Christ, part of the good news. Uh, we are baptized into his death, according to Paul in Romans 6. In verse 4, he says, We've been buried with him through baptism into death. And that likeness is seen in baptism, just as Christ was. And here's again the comparison, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the fundamentals of the gospel. We obey that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly will be in the likeness of his resurrection. The, the likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is what he's referring to in baptism. That puts us into Christ. That puts us into his death. When he says, you've not all obeyed the gospel, this is what he's referring to. That's obvious in verse 17 of Romans 6. We were the servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of 
of doctrine. Now the word form refers to this likeness, this similarity. Notice the definition of the term, the mark or stroke or blow or imprint. That's the impression that's left, a figure formed by a blow or impression, a form, teaching which embodies the sum and substance. Uh, we have found excellent evidence uh, in the New Testament from the, the belay, the, the stamped clay impressions of official seals of Isaiah, of Hezekiah, uh, of those official uh, in, the, in the king's court. Uh, in, in one instance, we found 51 of the belay, 26 of them were biblical names, great evidence. But that impression is the idea that's referred to in this form. You obeyed from the heart that form, that mold, that imprint of doctrine, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the likeness of his death being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. When people say this has nothing to do with salvation, they haven't read their New Testament. You have to obey or you have the vengeance of the Lord in flaming fire, those who do not obey the gospel. You obey the gospel from that form, that form of doctrine and that is the likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. You're baptized into Christ, into his death, in the likeness of that gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Called by the gospel, but I think we should ask which gospel. In the New Testament, there were a number of different gospels in Galatians 1, he said, I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Uh, what do you mean by that? Verse 7, it's not really another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. They had added things that were not in the New Testament. Some of the Old Testament requirements like circumcision were required and they were binding that on Christians. He says this, this is distorting the gospel of Christ. Galatians 2, he said, we didn't yield to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. There are some who don't teach the truth of the gospel and that constitutes a distortion and uh, we need to be aware of that. Uh, again, 2 Thessalonians 2, he called us by not just any gospel, but our gospel. And he said, we didn't yield so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. It means that you have to do what it says. You have to follow the New Testament, not just whatever tickles your fancy. Paul is warning Timothy about this in 2 Timothy 3. He said, continue in the things you've learned and been assured of knowing from whom you learned it. Did it come from the New Testament? Did it come from the apostles? Did it come from the synod, the council, human history that has nothing to do with the New Testament? Continue in the things you've learned and been assured of. If you don't, then you have another gospel, a distorted gospel. And he says, if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than that which we preach to you, this is not my idea, but this is what Paul said. Let him be accursed. It means damned. In 2 John 9, he says, everyone who does not abide in the teaching of Christ but goes beyond it has not God or does not have God. And that's how we get the mess that we see in the denominational world today. They're doing whatever they want to do. They go beyond the gospel that we find in the New Testament. And when we look at the church, we see his called out group called by his gospel. And that's what the New Testament describes and says you don't go beyond that. You follow the truth of the gospel. You don't follow a distortion of the gospel. You, don't, you continue in the things you've learned, you've been assured of from God's word. Now, we include everybody who does that, but God excludes those who don't. 
that's his description, not mine. We see an illustration of this clearly in Acts chapter 2. Those who had received his word when Peter preached the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost were baptized, which is what he told them to do for the remission of sins. Uh, that day there were added about 3,000 souls. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now to what did he add them? To which church? Well, <laughs> the one that he purchased with his blood. That's what the church is. Those who have been purchased, those who submit to his will and become Christians, who follow the gospel, our gospel, not the distorted gospel, continuing in the things they've learned and been assured of. They were added not to whatever church anybody wants to imagine, but to the one that Jesus died for. And he knows <laughs> where that is and where to put them. And he promised he would put them there when they do what he says do. If you just are baptized into Christ, into his death, reenact that gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you're then made free from sin. And that's what the church is. Those who obeyed the gospel were baptized into Christ. And that's his church. What is the church? Mentioned 61 times in the New Testament. That's it. You obey the gospel. You do what God says. Everybody who does that is included and is a part of his church. The question is, have you obeyed his gospel? And we would certainly encourage you to do that. I don't think there's anything in the world you need to do more. We thank you for listening this morning. We'd like to have you worship with us uh, at 1030 and 930 this morning. Thank you.